residual issues with the virus so that all of our people feel safe that are that are worried about any of those things um my prayer is that everybody gets on the same page and we'll all be back at church sunday i'm sorry wednesday night we'll have church wednesday night regularly at seven o'clock all of our young people the vans everything will be running as normal wednesday night so please be in prayer for that service and for those that have had issues with with the covid virus uh, Miss Cheryl has to go tomorrow and be <clears throat> tested again to make sure that she's clear and clean so she can um, go back to work and open her office back up in town. So y'all please be in prayer for her as she does those things. We have several prayer requests that we wanted to mention this morning. Um, please don't forget uh, Randy Lamb, good friend of mine. He is in the hospital at Mayo. Um, Randy's had several transplants. I say several. He's had a liver transplant and kidney transplant. And he has COVID virus that he can't seem to get shed of. He's, he's back in the hospital now with, um, with uh, low blood counts. All his fluids in his body are low. So y'all remember Brother Randy. Uh, probably a lot sicker than he's let on. But uh, please remember him. A great warrior for the kingdom. Um, I just pray that God raise him back up. Um, remember Danny Norris in your prayers. I, most of you saw last night on Facebook, all of our people, especially there in, um, in, in Slaughterville, Hoboken area, <clears throat> our brother Danny is one of our officers in Hoboken. Um, we all know that he had a, a brain aneurysm a couple of Saturdays ago and has been in a coma. He's still in a coma, but Miss Wendy said last night she zoomed, they were able to zoom and talk and um, I think she did the talking, but Brother Danny, his eyes were open, he was blinking, and he raised up like he wanted to get out of bed. So, um, God is still at work there. Uh, nobody give up praying. Remember to lift him up and his family, Miss Wendy. Miss Wendy, your faith and the way that you've honored God in this, in both situations, with losing your dad week before last and with your husband is admirable. And sister, we are praying for you. So just continue to pray for them and lift them up in your prayers. Um, as the days go by, thank you, Lord, for Miss Michelle uh, Boyd, how God has taken care of her. I, asked, I talked to Tom last night on the phone, and I said, wasn't it last Tuesday? He said, no, it was just this Tuesday. It felt like it had been two weeks since she had had a stroke um, where she, when she was having a stress test at the hospital. So they were able to take care of her, and now she's ready to come home. They're going to do one more. They're going to do one more um, scan to, uh, uh, I forget, an MRI. We're going to do one more MRI Monday, and um, after that, she's ready to come home. So thank the Lord Jesus, amen, <clears throat> that she'll be home and everything will be back to normal, and Cager will have his mama at the house, amen. Also remember, um, we're taking up a love offer next Sunday at church for Brother Roger Vili. so y'all remember them, and um, if you can, please be ready. Uh, take up an offer for them to give to help them uh, while Brother Roger's battling this this cancer. Um, I'm looking over here at my notes while I'm praying several people's called me. Remember Jonathan Davis, a young man in our community that had, was struck with leukemia. Uh, several weeks he had issues. Nobody knew what they were. Finally, they figured it out. And and for all intents and, pur intents and purposes, Jonathan nearly died. But Lord intervened. Um, he's home. Um, he's still having some issues. Um, the family, his, his wife had to, had to quit her job to take care of him. Um, she was driving back into, I think, to Savannah or wherever, or Atlanta, wherever he was at. And she wasn't able to keep her job that she would, she had only started at about a week or two earlier. They have a little fundraiser on, on her page. Um, if, if anybody would like to, I'd sure love to see a lot of people come in there and help them. If you could go on that page and donate five dollars whatever god lays on your heart is to um, megan cobb davis m-e-g-h-a-n-c-o-b-b-d-a-v-i-s megan cobb davis there's just a um a donate page there a little donate thing on that page there. if you would please go by if you could if you could spare it ten dollars or a thousand dollars please go by as a young couple with four children i believe um and they're doing their best to make ends meet, and they're doing it with their heads up. So um, uh, just pray for them. Lift them up in your prayers. And if there's any way you could donate, please do. 
please help them out. Also, <clears throat> all my prayer requests that I have here, I have lots of them. Miss Wanda Cleland, remember her? Um, Shirley Raper passed away. Teresa Bailey. Um, Tammy Bell has a cousin in ICU with double pneumonia. So keep them in your prayers. Lee Drury asked us to raise up the family <clears throat> of Skeeter Mahoney. Uh, that's Carolyn Mahoney. A lot of you know Miss Carolyn. Remember her and her family as they mourn the loss of uh, their daddy and husband, Skeeter, who died, I think, yes, Lee, I think it was yesterday morning early. Uh, hey, Brother Mike Lee, um, I think it was early yesterday morning, if I'm not mistaken, Lee. Um, but keep them in your, in your prayers. Also, Joe and Honey Roddenberry have an unspoken prayer request. Um, Lisa Chacon has asked us to pray um, for her um, journey, I guess you could say. She's had COVID for about 30 days. She's in the hospital with pneumonia, so keep her in your prayers. Susie Wilson asked us to continue to pray for Bacon County School Bus Rick. People, those that were involved in that, so keep them in your prayers. Um, um, several others listed those as well. Uh, Gwitha Tucker asked us to pray for her daughter-in-law and her pregnancy. Heather Heyman had an unspoken prayer request. Kenny and Gail Bauer <clears throat> asked us to lift up Steve Knox um, in your prayers. Also, Tammy Cruz Fitchett has an unspoken um, Amy Hendricks mom has breast cancer she was going to get a PET scan this coming week uh, remember John Coffey has some heart issues and we're to pray for those um, in his house um, we've had people's ask us to pray for our president our pastors our military our er elderly our sick and those missing each other with COVID amen Miss Jill Brand, uh, Jill Brand and, and uh, Johnny Davis again have to ask us to list up, lift up the Shirley Raper family Lindy, Linda Harris, uh, Henderson asked us to pray for our Danny Norrison family as well as Darlene Lee, Glenda Lee, Daniel Westbury. Remember all these folks from Miss Linda's prayer request. She also asked us to remember the lost. Amen. Um, remember Carl Davis has COVID. Um, uh, Doris Barnes. Remember the Doris Barnes family um, uh, from our, our church, the Hodges in our church that was there grandmother and mother and mother and mother-in-law so remember them in our church um shelby asked us to pray for michael farmer a young couple that's been in our church the past month and a half or so michael got a um he got a uh, chemical burn on his side so y'all remember michael uh, a good friend of mine kelly brooks is having trouble with with the covid virus he i think he may um I, i'm not sure if he's tested negative yet but he was in the hospital first of the week with breathing issues. Um, they sent him home with oxygen. So he's at home now with oxygen, and he's still doing his best to get over those things. Brittany Strickland and Brandon Strickland lost their mom in a tragic accident last weekend. Remember Calvin Miller? Um, Sandra Hendricks asked us to um, pray for her grandson who's moved to Virginia. He'll be stationed there for four years. Um, Wayne Smith asked us to remember uh, George Moxley. He has COVID. He's a pastor. Evelyn Hickox asked us to pray for her father-in-law, Russell Hickox. He had a stroke last month, and um, he's in Jessup on oxygen. Um, also, uh, Paula Hamm asked us to pray for Ms. Wanda Cleland. She's on a vent in the Brunswick Hospital. She's been at the hospital now for four weeks. How, if anybody's out there, how's Ms. Wanda doing? <clears throat> Ms. Wanda Cleland, if you would, please post that. Um, Somebody let us know how Miss Wanda um, is doing. Good to see you on here, Jonathan Davis. Amen, brother. We're pulling for you. Um, but if anybody knows how Miss Wanda Cleveland is doing, please let me know. Let us know on here because a lot of people are wondering. I'm getting a lot of messages asking about her. Um, Miss Beverly Hendricks Parker asked us to remember our teachers. And uh, also pray for um, a good friend who's having surgery on Wednesday, which was this past Wednesday. So, Miss Beverly, if you would, let us know how that went so we can, we can remember. I'm putting these prayers in my in my box here if there are any more prayer requests y'all please list them we can all see them here together and, and we'll be praying for them it's a small community we live in and uh, we want to take each other in love on each other make sure we're lifting each other up so we don't forget our prayer requests and and uh and forget about each other the devil would like for us to grow cold and hard against each other in these times i don't doubt that this covid virus is something from the devil yes i believe it's overly um, politicized and overly uh, if it wasn't on the news so much people wouldn't be as afraid but I'm going to tell you it's deadly 
There's some folks that have died from it. Uh, with just one degree of separation from our church, we we know of four. So, <clears throat> so we pray for these folks, and uh, we don't take it lightly. I like what Mike Rowe, the guy that's on the uh, the the hit television show Dirty Jobs, Mike Rowe. He wrote an op-ed, said that he was um, he wasn't terrified. People ask him why wasn't he terrified. He said, "Well, I'm not terrified." He said, "I'm concerned." but not terrified. And I, I think that's us. I think that we're concerned, but we're not terrified. Listen, God didn't give us a spirit of fear. He didn't give us a spirit to worry and be be overly uh, 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 worried about all the situation that's going on in and around this virus. Now, folks, you got to understand that God is in control. We still have to have faith that he can do what he said he'd do. He can raise us up. He can be a He can be a, a, the light on a shining hill if we'll let him. Now, listen, we can't get all caught up in the fear of all this virus stuff that's going on. But at the same time, we still need to take precautions because there's some folks that are fearful. And we need to be able to minister to these folks without running over them by saying, you don't need to do this and you shouldn't wear a mask ever and you shouldn't listen. Praise the Lord. Let, let's just be humble and, uh, and uh, not giving in to government things. People think, well, you just give in to government. No, it has nothing to do with those things at all. I just think we need to love on people. And uh, we need to understand where they are, and if they're fearful, we need to do our best to help draw them out of that and let them see that God is in control of every situation, and, and even this one. This hadn't snuck up on God. Uh, COVID, when it popped up here in our country really big in January, has not. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a surprise to the Lord. So as we see all this going on around us, please remember that the Bible tells us not to fear. That God is in control. Amen. I see here Amy Lyons is saying, Aunt Wanda is off the vent but still sedated. Everything's looking better. Continue to pray. Amen. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate you, appreciate you updating us. Let's pray for all of our prayer requests before we go any further. Lord, thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, you are faithful, Lord, in all that you do. Help us, God, to be faithful in all that you ask us to do. God, as we lift up these prayer requests, Lord, I thank you for the goodness in people's hearts as they pray and lift up each other. And God, as we get ready to preach this morning, Lord, I just pray that you'll loose me. I pray that you let me preach your word as if I'd never, as I'd never preached it before, as this might be my very last time ever preaching it again. God, I thank you for all the goodness I've seen this week in missionaries. And Lord, as we help one brother up in um, Virginia um, work on his new home, he's trying to move into so he can minister there through um, God's pit crew in that area right up there, Lord. I just pray you'll bless him and those around him, those workers that are there. Lord, I pray for our church member, Brother Johnny Wilds, Lord, as he's there, and he'll be there several more weeks, Lord, as he's there working and being the hand and feet from our church there at Oak Hill. I pray, Lord, all his needs are met while he's there. And, Lord, uh, the folks that are, that are there helping as well, Charlie and Terry and Dana and, Lord, all the ones that are there, I pray, God, you bless them, keep them close to you, keep them strong, keep them safe. And I pray for Brother um, Chris Childs and his dear wife and two children, God, as they do the ministry there, Lord, that we can't physically do ourselves. But, Lord, we support him in what he's doing. All these prayer requests on our list, Lord, you know each one. I pray for Roger Veeley, God, my brother, my, my, my partner, God. I pray you lift him up and hold him close, God. I pray you completely heal him in this time. I pray, Lord Jesus, you put him back to work. Thank you for him and his strength, his dear wife, all those people around him. Lord, I lift up Jonathan Davis to you. Lord, I just I just pray, God, that you'll continue to do a work in his life, not only physically, but spiritually. God, I pray you draw him closer to you for his dear wife, Lord. And I just pray, God, a special blessing on her as she's trying to take care of him, her family, her home, her finances, all those things going around there. Lord, so I pray for Miss Megan, God, and I pray that people donate to them, Lord, to help them out in this time of need, because, Lord, we'll all be in that spot one day. And God, it's so great to be in a community where people love each other and look out for one another. So God, I pray that that love is, uh, grows and glows in the life of these two people, God, and they see how much their community loves them. Lord, we, we know you love us because you sent us Jesus, and we're so thankful, God, it's by his shed blood we can know you for all eternity. It's, for, it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you would, now take your Bibles. And turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Um, I see you, Drew McCarthy. Pray for all schools and teachers. Amen. Amen. My, my daughter, Emma, will be glad 
um, to go. To, our school started last Monday, but Emma's been um, <laughs> on quarantine. <laughs> hey, you ought to see her and her mom. Amen. Now, her mom was on one end of the house, and Emma comes as far as from her place down to live near to the kitchen. And uh, they try to stay apart because Emma wants to go to school. So in case her mama tests positive, Emma don't even want to bring it up. She's going to say, I'm, I'm separate. So all of y'all that may be worried about Emma having anything, I can assure you she don't because she hasn't even got close to anybody. So that girl wants to go back to school. And the big reason for that is, is her mama has had her strip and clean most of this house with her. Uh, Emma's had to do and do and do. And her mama, is, she's felt better since first of the week. Uh, Cheryl's about cleaned up. She's about rubbed the paint, clean off the walls in this house. I don't, I don't, you know, uh, I, I have to show them how to rest. That, 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 this group, this group that I live with around here, none of them know how to rest. I said, look here, let me, let me show you how to do it. And I, so I sit down and I watch Andy Griffith. And I said, no, 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 this is, we're teaching, we're learning right here. So now y'all try to learn. Let me, let me teach y'all something. They don't know how to rest. Miss Sugar never has. There was a time when we were young, she'd get up about 11 o'clock at night and go to cleaning, go to, go to, go to working in the house and, and taking care of things. And I'll tell you, her mama, Miss Catherine, and her daddy, uh, Mr. Bud, uh, did an awesome job raising her as a young lady um, because I tell you, she's a great mama and she takes care of everything. Um, spoiled rotten. I am spoiled rotten. Got the greatest wife in the history of the whole world. And that's all I'm saying because I know she's in the other room in there and she's going to be all cheesy, so we'll leave that alone. But let's look at the scripture today uh, as, we're, as we're studying through here. And uh, now Paul, in this, in this part of scripture, I'm going to take those glasses off for a minute so I can get somewhere I can see. Paul is the writer here in the book of Romans. Paul is trying to tell the readers that everybody, all Gentiles, um, have a need for salvation, that Gentiles have a need for righteousness. See, it's at one point, the, uh, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all those guys, the disciples, everybody, was wanting to take the news just to the, to, the, um, to the Jewish people. They wanted to give it to the Jewish nation. They wanted to make sure that all the Jews, because they were, according to Old Testament and Scripture time, that all those folks, um, that, that was where God wanted his message, because they were his peculiar treasure. They were his chosen people, and still are. They were his chosen people. So they were trying to get the word out to them. See, when Jesus died on the cross, when he defeated death, hell, and the grave, he didn't make a way just for Jewish people to come to know him as Savior. Listen, he made a way for everybody to come to know him as Savior. And, and he, he said his word that he would that all men come to know him as Savior. And he means that as women too and children. But we have to understand that the scripture here, uh, when we start reading in Romans, he talks about, Paul talks about the need and the desire to get the word out to the whole world, not just to not just to a to a, to a group of people or one or two folks, but when he brings in the Gentile Gentiles, that's everybody except Jews. So he was the God really conscripted him, if you will, when he was struck blind on the road to Damascus. Well, I'm so glad I get to preach today. Listen. When he was struck blind on the road to Damascus, headed to, to throw those folks in jail, um, God saved him um, um, a few days later. Or God saved when he when he rose up, he said, Lord, what would I have me do? When he honored God and followed God, his duty then, Paul's calling in life, was to take the word of God to the Gentile nation. That's it. That was his, that was his goal. Now, you say, well, well, Brother Ray, I remember him arguing there on Mars Hill. I remember all the, the things he had to say for, against the Jewish people to try to confront him. You're exactly right. He brought the argument to the Jews or the leaders of the Jews. He brought the argument to them and said, listen, you guys need to pay attention because Old Testament says this. And listen, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was one of those those uh, those those um, young, young men that learned the law from one of the great lawyers in, in Jewish history, Gamaliel. So he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, learned what he should learn, and was about to be a great Pharisee, a, a great leader, and some probably one day a great ruler in the Jewish Pharisaical empire there with the church, probably at some point be it in the Sanhedrin as Gamaliel. So we know that Paul was, was, was groomed 
was, was groomed to, uh, to be a, um, a Jewish leader. So when God saved him, guess who he went to to confront with the truth? Jewish leaders. Hey, and a lot of them knew him. A lot of these folks knew him. They remember him being in school with them. They remember him growing up with them. They remember all these things. So who else could bring the word so clearly better than Paul? God knew, or he was Saul at the time. God changed his name to Paul. But who, who better to do that than Paul? So when God saved him, God had, God had a purpose for him. Hey, I'm going to tell you something this morning. As you listen on here, some of you won't hear, don't listen to this until late this afternoon or maybe tomorrow going to work. But I'm going to tell you something too. God saved you for a reason. God saved you for a purpose. And it wasn't just um, to look at what you had been doing and continue in that. That, that. that may not be God's reason. It may be. But God has a reason and a purpose in your life. I'm going to tell Jonathan Davis on here. Um, Lord raised him up at that hospital bed for a purpose. There's a reason, brother, that God has intervened in your life and raised you up. Um, brother Roger Ville, I'm going to tell you, brother, you know, me and you've talked about this. There's a reason God has raised you up and put you where you are for his goodwill and his word to be spread. And Lord, you, brother, you have been a blessing to our people and you will continue to be so. I pray that I pray that God continues to use you. Amen. I look around and think of all these people. Danny Norris is in the hospital right now. God has saved him. He has honored God with his life. And some people would look at this, his situation and say, wow, I don't, it's, it seems like he's not being blessed. Listen, I can tell you that old boy is being blessed right now. He, uh, his wife's being blessed. His daughter and son, all, they're all being blessed. All his people around him being blessed because they're seeing God at work. Listen, all of us right now are seeing God at work in and around the life of Brother Danny Norris. And listen, I just believe in my heart that somewhere here in the very near future, Brother Danny's going to wake up and look into that Zoom camera and tell Miss Wendy that he loves her and that he is glad that God gave her to him for a wife. Now, all these things having said that, we look at the greatness of God. We know that God has saved us for a purpose. God has saved Brother Danny for a purpose. God has saved all of us for a purpose. These glasses are about to drive me bazonkers. But God saved us for a, a purpose, each and every one of us. There's work to do, and we need to make sure that we're involved in getting that work done. Amen. Make sure you're getting that work done and be involved in it. So look with me, if you would, in chapter 14. I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 14. Chapter 1, verse 14. I started a little bit of this on um, Wednesday night. And I want to jump off here and let's just, let's just preach it. Amen. Let's just get after these verses right here. But Paul goes on to tell the Romans. He's trying to explain to the Romans. Now, who are the Romans? A lot of times we just see this as a book. We see it as a book just like Corinthians or Ephesians. you got to recognize the Romans were the rulers of the known world. So as he's sending this letter to the Roman churches and the Roman people, the Roman Christians, um, um, that's a select group of people that Paul's able to reach out to. So he's telling them that the Gentiles have a need of righteousness. Who were the Gentiles? Romans. The Romans were the Gentiles. They needed righteousness. Now the Romans at that time, um, they had they they served hundreds of gods. They was they was gods all over. They you know they had was it was it um, Heracles and and uh, and. Um, and uh, I, uh, I can't remember all of them. The Ajax, Ajax, that's something Ajax won't tell you. That was a god to them. Um, there's several, all the gods I can't, well, man, earlier this morning I had about 15 of them memorized. But there were several different Greek and Roman gods that they all served. And these guys lifted them up and they praised them and they prayed for them. And, and they, they had certain gods that they that they wanted their women blessed by so they could have children. And they, they had certain gods that they had, they prayed to that would bless their elderly. They had certain gods that they prayed to before they went into war, that they would uh, um, um, bathe their shields in blood and their, their, their swords in blood if they honored this god. So all these gods they listed and, 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 and lifted up and prayed to. Paul says, you guys have need of righteousness. You guys think you okay. You guys think that somehow or another you are honoring God um, or a God by the way that you live. He's trying to get across to them. There's only one God, and that God desires us to be righteous. So he tells them here, 
that the Gentiles have need of righteousness. Let me let me back up and read these read these verses here, and let's have a let's have a look at what he has to say. He said, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Amen. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. He was thankful for the Roman Christians, and everybody all over the place was talking and bragging about the Roman Christians. He said, he, he said uh, I make mention of you always in my prayers, making requests, if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. He wanted to go and see him because they were far, far away. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you might be established. That is, that I might be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. He wanted to be with other believers. He wanted to be with those Roman believers. He was excited because they was on fire and they was doing things for the kingdom. And listen, when he was able to win some of these folk to the cross, wow, it began to change the whole world. Because Christianity began to spread more and more because the romans were rulers of the known world so if those christians started what those roman christians started winning other romans and it just it would just grow exponentially all these things would happen and the church would grow and grow and paul wanted to see that be part of it and then verse verse 13 he said now i will not have you be ignorant brethren that oft times i purpose to come unto you but let what was let hitherto that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. He said, "Listen, I I, I want to make, make sure I'm, I'm transparent before you." Is what he's saying. I want you guys to know that I'm I'm kind of um, methodical in what I do. Um, and and he said, "Please don't think I'm being sneaky, but I want you to know that I'm coming there so that I can win some of you to Jesus. That's that's why I'm coming. I want to have some fruit among you, um, even as among." other Gentiles. So when he says other Gentiles, he's making claim that the Romans are Gentiles as well. He said, I've won Corinthians, I've won Ephesians, I have won people from Africa, I've won all these other Gentiles. He said, Romans, I want to have some more fruit from the Roman Empire. I want to win Romans. What, what a desire. You know, do we have a desire? I get thinking sometimes, what kind of desire do we have to win souls to the kingdom of God? I'm going to tell you, everybody's not gifted with the gift of gab, if you will. God's given it to me. I'm thankful that God has let me be able to communicate the gospel and to share it and talk with people. I'm thankful that in my everyday work uh, workplace that I'm able to, to have time. God's, God's allowed my workplace where I can speak to people. I go house to house doing service calls and, and making repairs. And, and God has allowed me a great vehicle to be able to get into homes and, and, you know, even through the Facebook stuff, people begin to know who you are. So we begin to think about that, and God has opened a great big door. And I'm thankful that God has let me speak to other people about Jesus. But I'm going to ask you something. Do we look for ways to win folks? Do we look for ways? Do we ask God to show us um, ways to win people to Him? You know, I think one of the greatest desires that a Christian ought to have is the desire to see other people be a Christian, come to know Christ. That is the single greatest desire as a Christian, other than being in heaven and other than my own family being safe and, and Christ-like and honoring Him. My, I have a, a, a great desire for other people to come to know Christ and to, and to be one to the gospel. It's, it's a great desire inside me. I think that all Christians ought to have that. And, and, but see, and here's the thing. Not everybody's going to be able to go out and knock on a door. Not everybody's going to get on Facebook and preach, and they're not going. To, not everybody's going to get on here and talk and, and go around and, 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 and be able to go and witness to folks um, um, outwardly. But here, here's what a lot of people do: the, a lot of people don't think that this is soul winning when they pray. Hmm. Hey, listen, unless unless the Holy Spirit goes before your pastor, brother Ray, unless the Holy Spirit goes before him. I'm, I'm doing it all on my own. What I need, I need you, church, and people out there, to be praying as as we go to take the gift of gab, the, the way to woo people, to talk to them. We need to know that those people that 
or behind the scenes that maybe don't have the gift of gift is praying for us, is lifting us up, is, is, is going before the throne of God saying, Lord, please bless these folks that are winning souls. You're, listen, for everyone we win, you're winning them too. Amen. As we as a church, I think about Brother Johnny being up there in Virginia right now. Listen, Brother Johnny's up there doing work for Brother Chris Child's missionary, and, and he's working. Listen, several other people's up there working, uh, building that house for that young missionary and his two children so they can better serve their mission. Our church supports Brother Chris Childs personally as a missionary. He, we, 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 uh, we, we support them financially every, every month. So our goal is, is, to, is to look at that and maybe, maybe be able to um, meet more of his needs. But you got to understand something, church. Some of y'all are here right now looking at me. Let me look over here. Um, let me look. Drew McCarthy, you're here. Andrew Barton. Um, let's, I'm looking. Church members. There's a, there's a lot of y'all that ain't in our church. Brother Victor Hodge, I see you. Um, Miss Darlene, Roger Veeley. Um, a lot of people. Miss Libby Page, a lot of folks. Here's the thing. You're in Virginia, too. Brother Johnny's up there being the hands and feet. But that hands and feet's got to have a heart. Amen. You're the hand, while he's being the hands and feet, you're the heart. You're the one that's praying. You're the one that's lifting up. And listen, you're the one sending financial help to that young missionary and his family while they get the work done. Brother, Brother Chris Childs, he came to our church some time back. I'd like to get him to come again and talk about this new mission that he's involved with called God's Pit Crew. You can look it up online. Please do. God's Pit Crew. Um, it, it's about the... Uh, uh, I think it stems kind of around the racing scene up in Virginia and all that area up there. But they build houses for people that have been been uh, have had them destroyed, especially those that are in the ministry. And and here here's why it's special to my heart. I have a desire and a, and, a, and a move in my own spirit that we ought to be making sure that our our old timey preachers that have retired are okay and financially able to meet their meet their needs. Um, a lot of times our preachers retire and uh, uh, they didn't have savings. A lot of a lot of means I can remember my own grandpa, Preacher Mac, worked his whole life, uh, pastor of the church and worked in the frame. They didn't have a lot of savings. They didn't have a lot of, they preached and most times churches um, gave them enough money to buy groceries and that was it. They gave what they could and men of God were faithful to the calling that God gave them. Only in today's time are our pastors some of the most, the highest paid people in, in, in on the market. Listen, uh, it has changed. Now our churches are giving pastors um, retirement and benefits and things. That's an awesome thing. Listen, thank you, church. Because, listen, our railroad people has it, our teachers has it, other professions have all these things. Our social, our preachers. But listen, but there's a group of people behind us that retired 10, 15 years ago or five years ago that preached through the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s that didn't have all those things. And now some of these folks, if I can say it in a word, sometimes live in squalor, who honored God, who did all the things, and while they're happy as larks, still need to make sure that we as people are taking care of those folks. That's, one, that's a ministry that I'd like to see our church in the future uh, engage and, and look into and see if they're, listen, I, I don't know that we're supposed to take care of all the retired preachers in, in Florida and Alabama and North Georgia and South Georgia, but listen, I guarantee you there's several of them within 50 miles of our little old church, and we could probably help one or two of them by, listen, they may need a car. Some of us may have a car we're going to trade in. You're not going to get but $1,000 for them. They might can use that car. They might need their grass cut. They might need their light bill paid. They may need some money to buy their grandkids Christmas. I think it would be a great ministry for us to come along beside some of these preachers. Folks, you got to understand, just because you don't go out and do that work, and just because you're not going out finding these preachers or, or building these houses in Virginia, you are still part of the work. You are the hands and feet, you're the heart, you're the head, you're the soul of all the ministry that's going on. Listen, Paul is telling the, the people here in the book of Romans that every person, every person has a calling. And that's what he says. He said, I have a calling. He said, I'm a debtor, in verse 14, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians. I'm a debtor both to the Greek and to the barbarians. The Greek being the highest in the learned 
people in this time period, this time frame. The Greeks were the were the scholars, the barbarians, not so much. So you, you would see the Etruscans and the Plebes, if you will. So you had these two groups of people. Paul said, listen, I want to win some Greeks. I want to win some barbarians. He said, I want to have fruit uh, between the both of them. He said, and I'm a debtor to both. You see, you got to understand something that, that Paul most likely saw himself, you know, as one of the upper crust as a lawyer. But now he is at the bottom of the barrel being chased around by lawyers and being chased around by the hierarchy of the church. So now he sees himself as one of the lower. He said, I, he said, I know how to be up and I know how to be down. He said, and I want to make sure that in the midst of all that, I'm winning souls. We can all agree with that. He said, I'm a debtor, both to the Greek and to the barbarians, both to the wise and the unwise. And verse 15 says, and he says, so much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome. His three I am statements here. I'm a debtor, I am ready, and I'm not ashamed. He said, I am ready to come to Rome and preach to you. Understand what that means. Of all places to go and preach the gospel, one of the scariest places for a Christian to go and preach it was Rome. And why, brother, why do you say it, brother? Listen, they was actually catching Christians and putting them in the Colosseum for sport and letting lions chase them around that arena until they got, grew weary and the lion would catch them and eat them. And the Romans would stand and cheer. Christians was, Christian children were hurled in there by the dozens and chased around and killed by animals just for the joy, so that the, just for the Greeks could have some joy, just so the Romans would have the joy of watching some sport before some of their um, gladiators came in, before their other warriors came in, before the slaves came in and, and died. All these things happened. So it was a terrible place for Christians in Rome. So Paul said, listen, I'm ready. He said, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Listen, he recognized that when he said, I am ready to come to Rome, it took some, some intestinal fortitude to get to a place where he could say, I'm ready. Hey, I am ready. You ever, you ever been somewhere where you was worried uh, to go and do? Uh, I can remember when I first went on a visitation with a man by the name of Danny Zorn. I bet you some of y'all know Brother Danny Zorn. Um, I don't know where Brother Danny's at today or if he's even alive. But I can remember, I was so afraid. Listen, I was a, I was a scared to go out and, and, listen, I hadn't long been saved. And I knew that at some point I had to go out and start talking to other people about Jesus. I, I had to do that, but I didn't really know how. And so I was afraid I was going to blow it. Man, I was so afraid. And I remember us getting in that church and praying before we went out. Um, and, and we didn't just go knock on doors. In the neighborhood door, but we didn't do that. We ha we some people had visited our church, and we called and made an appointment, and we went and see them. And honestly, I think that that's the best way. I know there are some people that knock on doors. That that's the way God's called you to do it. I believe a good way for me and our church to do it is 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 to do something maybe quarterly where we knock on doors or, or maybe bathe our community in, in in chicken dinners or whatever. But when we find somebody joins our church or, or comes to our church for a visit, we as a church need to do a better job in finding out who they are and where they live and a phone number. If we can do that, we can reach out to these folks and 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 set up an appointment and they can talk to Brother Ray. I, I, I'd love to do that. Listen, we got we, we need a group of people. We need, we need that to be somebody's job in church. I know we have our ushers, our greeters, that put things into people's hands, especially if they think they're new. But not always does the person leave something in the offering plate saying who they are or where they're from or their phone number. We need some people that that's their ministry. That they're, they're, that's just their job to make sure that we find out who people are and get it to me um, so that I can send them a text that afternoon. Hey, man, I'm glad you came. Glad you came out to God's house to be with us today. Um, can I come by and see you sometime? Would you like to see me? You got some questions? I'd be glad to answer them. You can get a lot done that way. That needs to be somebody's job, and uh, and as as we as we go forth and, and do that, that works out. That works out well. We win a lot of souls that way. But I can remember me and brother Danny getting into church that day, and uh, we got down there and prayed, and I was scared to death. And I stood up and turned away from the altar. Was going out through the front door. I was trying to catch my breath because I was worried. I didn't know what to expect. I just knew brother Danny was going to say, "Knock on the door and you tell them to come to church. You tell them to to, to come to church, or they going to." 
uh, uh, go to hell and fry like bacon. I just knew he's going to tell me to tell somebody something like that, and I was scared to death. But what it is, I stopped there in the sanctuary, and I remember going, Whew. and I thought to myself, I'm ready. I'm ready. Can I tell you? <laughs> it was nothing like that. We went over to those people's houses. They were so sweet, so nice. And me and Brother Danny came, went in, and we sat and talked with them, and they were they had visited our church, and one thing led to another, and I was able to give my testimony. I didn't quote one verse. I don't know that I knew any verses by heart at that time in my life. But I said, listen, I, I said, all I can tell you is what happened to me. And I, I began to share that testimony of what God did to me and how he saved me and how he brought me out of sin. And uh, it had an effect on them, to say the least. And they're, as, as, as far as I know, they're still in church today. But it had nothing to do with me. It had, it had something to do with God's people were praying. You see, as me and Brother Danny left to go do the visit, we left people at the church praying. Folks, were at, folks stayed on the altar from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock on that Tuesday night. On the altar praying while we were out doing the hands and feet. We were out doing the, the, the gab work, if you will. And those, listen, those prayers, if you ask me, were far more important. They were far more important. Paul said, I am ready. Paul was, he had to go, whew, he, you know, he could die. He could go to Rome. Listen, and be a steak burger for a line. Oh, Paul had to had to catch himself and say, okay, I'm ready. Whew, I'm ready. I'm ready to go get it done now. Uh, let's go. Let's go. He said, I'm ready to come to you. Because then he backs it up by saying, for I am not ashamed. Folks, listen. If there was ever a time we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel, it's today. I'm sick and tired of seeing all the media coverage about so much ungodly things thinking it's okay. The more they heat that stuff on television and more they post it on Facebook, the, the, the further back in the corner good godly people get. They back off thinking, well, I'm going to be odd. I'm going to be the odd man out, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick out if I, if I follow Jesus now. If I pray in public, if, if I honor God, I'm, I'm going to stick out. See, I don't like the fact that we have to do our Sunday mornings on here. Um, I think that's part of the devil, too. Well, listen, we got to get to a place to where we get, when we get past this virus, that this right here was just to help us get past it. This is not a fix. We, listen, we need to go to church. We need to gather together in the church house. This, this is it in the final thing right here. Sadly, there's going to be a lot of people that feel more comfortable meeting in the privacy of their own home, quietly, sitting before a computer, hearing the gospel. We need to get you out and bring you down there to God's house to be with other Christians, to be with people that are, that are loving on Jesus, that are hearing God's word. And when you're down there with them, then you begin to recognize that you don't have to be ashamed, that you don't have to be afraid. There's going to be people that are afraid in this world right now. We don't have to be part of those people. And listen, I am not ashamed of the gospel. You say, what do you mean by that? Listen, I ain't afraid to say that Jonah was swallowed by a whale, lived in the belly of that whale for three days, and God, and that, that, that whale spit him up on the bank, and he run up on the bank and then finally went and spoke to the folks that God said to speak to. Listen, I'm not ashamed of that. You believe that, right? Believe every part of it. Listen, I, listen. if Jesus can stand at the edge of a graveyard and shout for Lazarus to come out of a tomb, then yeah, I believe God can do it. And I, I'm not ashamed to say that God can raise Lazarus from the dead. I'm not ashamed that God can grow a man's arm back. I'm not ashamed to say that God can stop a whole a, a procession of, of, a, of a funeral going down the road and God can stop it and raise a man up that's been dead for 10 days. God can raise him and put that bad boy right back by his mom. I believe it. I, listen, I don't have a problem. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Not one least. I don't have a problem when people say, you believe that Jesus rose from dead? Yes, he did. Let me tell you what else he did. While he was dead. He descended into hell and defeated death, hell, and the grave. Listen, he defeated them. He's got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And I believe every part of it, every, every iota, everything that hurts my feelings, everything that gets, that gets under my skin, every time I look at it, I find that thou shalt not. I believe every single part of it. I believe every single part of it. No, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. The problem we're having today is people... People won't be ashamed of it. Every new version of the Bible we're getting now is a little less dramatic. You're finding less blood in it. 
in the Bibles. They're coming out today. You're finding less of this. Now, I don't, listen, I don't normally preach on this. Y'all know I'm a, you know I'm a King James guy. I don't normally preach on this. Don't hurt nobody's feelings. But I'm going to tell you something. But we're getting the Bible so condensed, so so um, watered down to at some point it's going to be just a just a book like a commentary. When, when people's going to say, well, we might need to get the old book out and see what it really means. Listen, just get the old book out now. Amen. I get this book out and I like to read what thus saith the Lord. There's going to come a time in, in the new Bibles and the new things being written where people's going to completely um, not put, but the writers aren't going to put in that, that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. You know, they're trying to teach now, they're trying to teach now that um, that Jonah and the, and the whale is just a story that was taught to children to put them to sleep at night, that it was a story that evolved into something else, that, that when it was when it was written, that it was it was evol evolved into that book. That it was something that was that was brought about when they canonized scripture. It was brought in and assumed to be part of God's word. It was God's word. It is God's word. And so we look at that and now um they, people are thinking now that well it was just it's just something to put kids to sleep at night. Listen, you can believe that if you want to. And what's gonna happen is is people's gonna get more watered down and more watered down and before long they're gonna take the blood clean out of of redemption. And before long, they're going to take the idea of death clean out of salvation. They're going to take the idea that one hung on the cross and died for our sins, that took the lashes and died um, on a cross and went to heaven and is making intercession for us. They're going to say there is no place like heaven. All of us just get to go there. It's just a place of higher learning. It's just a place of a better feeling after we leave this earth. Everybody ought to be happy. Everybody ought to believe the same thing. We're all going to the same place. No, we're not. There are folks that's going to bust hell wide open and go to church every week. There's folks that believe and are sitting in other other uh, uh, type church settings. They call it church. Listen, if you and this this going this going to separate some of you. But if you believe in the Mormon theology and doctrine, you ain't saved. Amen. There's going to be some out there in Jehovah's Witness doctrine. If you listen, if you believe and you follow that doctrine, you believe that doctrine be true, you ain't saved. Listen, you got to be careful. There's only one way of salvation. Jesus plus nothing equals salvation. We can call it all we want to. And listen, I, I feel bad about even casting shadows on, on, on those that I believe aren't Christian. Because, because I, I don't want to offend anybody on here. But, but you got to understand, we as ministers of the gospel have to call it a duck. We have to make sure that our people know where we stand. And know where, uh, know where we are in a situation. We got to know that today there are people out there that are trying to bring Christian people into their fold. Now, they can't have their salvation, but they can have that family. And listen, in 50 years, in 50 years, where will the church be if it continues like it is? 50 years from now, without a great awakening, well, listen, without a, without a great revival, where will our churches be? Where will we be if we don't start... Uh, 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 calling truth truth and a lie a lie. Where will we be? Paul said, I'm not ashamed. Yeah, I'm not ashamed. And listen, I tell you at the corner of Slaughterville and Central Avenue, you can come over there and you're going to hear some truth. There's going to be some folks over there that, uh, that are hearing the truth, that are going out into the world and they're doing things. Listen, I'm excited to be part of a church where people are involved in ministry that I don't have to head up. Praise God. There's other people excited about doing ministry, not just their pastor. Praise the Lord. God's good. Because I get to stand back and watch them grow, and I draw joy from their growth. I, I'm with Brother Johnny, and I, I'm certain he don't watch this because he's not on Facebook. Listen, he's he not on Facebook. He wouldn't even have a phone if he didn't have to sell those containers. <laughs> Amen, Brother Johnny. He ain't hearing this. But listen. There's folks out there, this, 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 uh, this, this like Brother Johnny, just going to go out there and do the work. And I get excited when I watch Brother Johnny. When I saw him this past, I got to Virginia Thursday morning, me and Brother Joey Lee went up there and installed some air conditioning unit for that, that young man. And matter of fact, we got to go back and I'm going to need some help. I'd like to have about five or six people go with me um, maybe Thursday week. Not this Thursday, but next Thursday for two days. Hard working. Got to have it done. But when I pulled up there and saw Brother Johnny, you know what I saw? I saw Oak Hill Baptist Church. Oak Hill Baptist Church was ringing the bell in Virginia. Up there, what, Danville, Virginia. 
Oak Hill Baptist Church was ringing the bell. You say, well, it was just Brother Johnny. Oh, no. Oh, no. The whole church was right there behind him. I could see a whole church and knelt down and prayed as Brother Johnny went about his work in that house. Listen, Brother Johnny said his business ain't never been so good. Oh, he told me the other night. Uh, when was Friday night. He cooked, he cooked a foot tub full of fried uh, deer meat and a foot tub full of them red potatoes. He squished through that French fry maker and fried them. And I tried my best to eat every one of them. But listen, he told me that while he was up there, his business, he, it ain't never been so good. He said, see, like when he goes off on missions, that God blesses him in ways he can't even imagine. So he's going to stay there until that house is finished or until God is, he knows that God's done with him. Listen, you know what I got to say to that? I got to say to that, Brother Johnny, hey, you got some people behind you praying for you that is lifting up every single thing you do. You are the hands and feet of our church right now. And listen, the next time there's going to be somebody up, Brother John Sartain, as he's out doing mission work and doing for our community in the name of our church. I get to think about Brother Roger Veeley as he goes for his treatments where he's standing at that door of the church. Brother Roger, you're the hands and feet of our church. You are not ashamed of the gospel, brother. Amen. I think about all these people that are doing their work day in and day out. All of our school teachers, all of our people that love Jesus. I tell you, we're in a, we're, we're in a, 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 a bubble where we live, and that's a good thing. Because our teachers love Jesus, and they tell our kids in a public school paid for by tax dollars that Jesus is alive and well. Amen, teachers. God bless you. Some of the strongest FCA groups anywhere in the country are in southeast Georgia because our people are saved and they are not ashamed of the gospel. It is awesome to pastor a church in southeast Georgia. When I was up in Virginia, um, some of the missionaries that were there that were helping do some of the work so, uh oh, there comes one of them South Georgia preachers. Y'all better tighten up. And some people might take that as a slight. I don't. Hey, I like the fact that they think that that, that we've got the ear of God. <laughs> Are we their moral compass? No, no, not at all. But at the same time, I am thankful that they recognize something different about the men of God and the preachers of God, and I am thankful to be where we are. Man, God be good to us. Let me finish here. I'm about done. Praise the Lord and the priest now. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. That's what Paul said. The power of God uh, unto salvation. You can be saved if you believe in the word of God and in the gospel of Christ. If you believe the gospel of Christ, meaning that Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, is on the right hand of the Father. If you believe those things, you that, that is literally the key. That's the key to the gate. To get into glory. Woo woo. That's the key to the gate. Amen, Brother Ray. Listen here. If I was at church, people would be yelling, Amen, me all at the, on the stage. I didn't even get me shooting Emma sitting on either side over there saying, Amen, Daddy. Woo. Amen, baby. Amen. We need to be some Amen in here. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Meaning that the Jews had the first opportunity and they chose not to. But now it's also not for the Jew, but for the Greek. Verse 17, finish with this. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For therein is the goodness, the holiness, the righteousness of God revealed from the faith in God to the faith in Jesus to the faith in us, from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Folks, I got faith that our church is going to continue to grow and prosper. I've got faith in that. I believe that our church is uniquely set up with the people that are there to grow a kingdom church that's going to prosper for years to come. The network of people that are there right now are people that love Jesus and don't mind stepping out on faith. I'm, I'm so thankful I don't, I, this, is, this may offend some, some of you folks that's at other churches, but I'm so thankful that our church is not an old church. Not against others, not against others. What I'm thankful for is that, that our church is not a family-owned and operated church. You know what I mean. Don't act like you don't. Some of you are trying to take offense. I can feel it, too, feel it coming over. But I'm so thankful that a person who's brand new that comes into our church 
can go right to work in any spot in the church where our leadership feel if they're ready and everybody's okay. Hey, I've been places where, bless the Lord, you didn't go in that social hall. Would you go in that social hall, open that refrigerator, or have something without asking so and so? Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm so thankful to be in a place to where that church and everything that's there is just as much the brand new person it is the one that's been there when they started in 1984. I'm so thankful. I, I don't even want to mention the names of the folks that I'm thankful for, but it was because of their leadership and because of their selflessness that the church is what it is now, prepared to leap and, and take on this next decade. It's ready because of your work. You're the hands and feet. We, those of us that have the gift of gab, we'll continue to grow it. And at some point, somebody's going to come behind us and continue that work. But the church right now is in a unique place. We have to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. God bless you all. And I pray you have a great day. Y'all please remember Brother Johnny up in Virginia. Um, he said he was going to the Church of God church today. Whoop, whoop. I told him, I said, now you get on in that singing now. You sit up front. And when somebody says, well... You say well with them. Amen. That's what they mean. They mean amen. You get up there on that front and get you a fan and wave that thing. A hanky or something. Wave that thing. But y'all pray for Brother Johnny and pray for all those that are being the hand and feet of Jesus today. And, and before I go, I want to tell you this. You literally, you really cannot stay here. I hope I don't turn into a cliche for you. But I want that to be the last thing you hear. I want that to be the last thing you remember when I close off on, the, on, on Facebook Live and stuff like that. I want it to be the last thing you hear. And the last thought that you remember is that when you die, you don't stay here. You go somewhere else, either heaven or hell. Please remember, folks, you can't stay here. God loves you.